All right, open your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Well, I've already made my confession to you that last week I thought was Father's Day. So this is uh, Father's Day 2.0. And uh, there's never enough time to talk about all of the good things about our Heavenly Father. I could preach the doctrine of God's goodness for days and weeks and months. And uh, he is a good God, isn't he? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Amen. Amen. Okay, good. He is a good God. And I'm thankful for our Heavenly Father. Last week, we talked about three attributes that we ought to be uh, mimicking. We talked about uh, kindness, patience, and gentleness. And uh, let me ask you, as an earthly father, as a Christian, are you... Are you kind to people? Are you patient with people? And are you gentle with people? I think one of the hardest things that uh, we deal with out of all of those probably is, uh, well, gentleness. I think just being gentle with people. I mean, kindness and patience, yes, but uh, you know what? They're all difficult, aren't they? Don't you struggle with every single one of those? Just be gentle, be kind. Like that sign I saw I mentioned last week, just be nice, right? If people would just be nice. And we talked about those three things uh, this morning. We're going to talk about three more. I mentioned to you in Ephesians chapter 5, be therefore followers of God as dear children. Be followers of God as dear children. Uh, That word followers means to mimic. Imitate. Imitate God. You can't think of a a better person to imitate, right, than God. You want to be just like your heavenly father. You might not want to be like your earthly father, but you really want to be like your heavenly father. He's perfect in every way. We're going to talk about three things this morning that I hope will be a blessing. Three things that we can mimic, three attributes of God that we can mimic. First of all, let's talk about love, right? Let's talk about love. If if you're going to imitate any characteristic, any attribute of God, we should should imitate the attribute of love. It's probably one of the most fulfilling things that you'll actually uh, imitate when it comes to loving people. I mean, it's just amazing love. It's an amazing love. Are you familiar with the song, And Can It Be, published in 1738 by Charles Wesley. These are the simple words of the refrain, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amazing, amazing love. Well, what is so amazing about the love of God? I'll tell you, first of all, it's amazing that he started this whole thing. It wasn't that we are are, are, are initiating this love, it's that God initiated it first in 1 John 4. We love him because he first loved us. Just remember that. He started this. We are only responding to the love that God has showed to us. And how did he love us? He loved us primarily by dying for us. Now, isn't that just counter-religion? Now, I'm sure that there are some religions out there somewhere that I, I don't know of that where, where, where maybe God initiated this love, but, but this really is, um, is primarily a Christian thing. Where is it that you find that the deity laid down their life for the servant, for the subject? I think it's, uh, it's, it's I don't know, pretty, pretty much a Christian thing. Where God, our Heavenly Father, loves us and laid down his life for us first. And in response to that, then we love him. This is an amazing, an amazing amount of love. In Ephesians chapter 3, flip back a couple chapters in the book of Ephesians. Chapter 3, verse 17 and 19, it says this in verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ. Listen to this. This is amazing. 
which passeth knowledge. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Like you can't even understand how amazing the love of God is. The fact that he loved us so much that he gave his only son to die for us is just an example of that tremendous amount of love. He loved us so much he sent his son to die for us. Now, I, I would die. I would die for my children, but I would never want my children to die for me. And I would never want my children to die for you. But you know what? That's how amazing God's love is. Especially if I only had one son. One child? An only begotten child? This is an amazing love. It passes tremendous amounts of knowledge. We'll never understand how good God is in his love. But Christ he gives his life for his own in John 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. He gives his life for his own. He gives his life for others. This is great in John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. This is the top. This is the capstone of love. This is the crest. This is the summit, the apex, the zenith. The very top of all love is that you lay down your life for your friend. No greater love has any man than this. And Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. You cannot beat that kind of love. And can I tell you this as, as earthly fathers? As earthly fathers, if we are to imitate this love, this is a hard thing to imitate. But it's the most rewarding when you love others, when you love your children the way that God loves his children. It's so fulfilling. It's so fulfilling. Uh, Christ not only gave his life for others, he gave his life for sinners. He gave his life for sinners. But God, and it says in Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loved us so much that while we were still sinners, he didn't die for the righteous. He died for the ungodly. <laughs> That's amazing. That is an amazing love. To die for a sinner, an ungodly person, an unrighteous person. God's love is amazing. Christ loved even his enemies and commanded us that we are to love our enemies as well. Matthew 5, 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies. That's big. Loving your own, that's, that's hard to do. Loving others, yeah, that's harder. Loving, loving sinners, yeah, I don't know about that one. But now love your enemies? No, come on. Really? That's something that we ought to mimic of our Heavenly Father? Well, be followers of God as dear children. Yes, my friends, we need to be followers of God. We need to be imitators, mimickers of God. And he said to love your enemies. Let me tell you, this is a commandment. Go love your enemies. Love those people who are against you. He goes on in this verse, in verse 44. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them, which is spitefully use you and persecute you. Amazing amounts of love. Wouldn't you just love to have the love of God? I mean, if you, could just, if you could just take that love just a little bit, bottle it up, and just share that with somebody. God's love is so great that nothing, not you and not someone else, nothing is able to separate you from that love. Not your present sin, not your past sin, and not your future sin. Nothing can separate you from God's love. Romans 8, 20, or 30, Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature is able to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can you imagine having so much love that nothing, Thing is able to separate you from it. We oftentimes ask ourselves, well, I don't know if God loves me anymore. 
Maybe some trial or some, some thing has come in your life, some tragedy, and you, you, you might ask yourself, well, I'm just not sure if God loves me anymore. Well, friends, nothing can separate you from that love. You don't have to ever worry about that. There's a lot of things that I worry about, right? Even though you're supposed to be anxious for nothing. <laughs> a lot of things I worry about. And it's not the coronavirus. Not worry about that. One thing I am not worried about is whether or not God loves me. He loves me so much. He loves me to the uttermost. It's unshakable. You can't shake the love of God. Some bad thing comes in your life, and the first thing you ask is, does God love me? You say, no, God loves me. This I know. Because the Bible has told me so. I wish we loved others the way that God loved us. As earthly fathers, as earthly fathers, we need to be mimicking this with our children, loving them even though they're sinners. And your children are sinners. We need to love them though they're sinners. Maybe they're against us and they hate us. And you know what? We still love them. Love your children. Secondly, secondly, I think this is something that maybe we, we seem to miss, but uh, something we need to mimic is the holiness of God. If there's any characteristic that I think God wants to be defined by, I think it's his holiness. I think that is the stabilizing factor in all. I, you know, if, if God is going to be just, I want him to be holy, I mean, let's, let's face it. If God is going to be merciful, I want him to be holy. This is a, a very stabilizing characteristic, and, and it should be a stabilizing characteristic for our families. When I, think about, when I think about me as a father, when I think about my dad, when I think about other dads, et cetera, et cetera, I think about just this idea of being holy. Charles Ryrie said this, holiness means not only that he is separate from all that is unclean and evil, but also that he is positively pure and thus distinct from all others. So the question is, is are you separate from uncleanness and positively pure? Friends, I, I am not. And if you say that you are, you're a liar and therefore you're not. None of us are, but it's something that we should strive for. Cleanness, positively pure. Being holy is not just for fathers, though. It's for followers. It's not just for, it's not just for dads. It's not just for those of us who have children. It's for those of us who don't have children. It's for all Christians out there. It's for the women. It's for the men. It's for the children. It's for the adults. It's for, it's for all people across all walks of life to be holy. Holiness is for everyone. We should be holy, and, and, and we should be holy as God is holy. I think God wants to be known as holy. God is worshipped as holy. In, uh, in John's revelation, we see in, uh, in chapter 4, we see this uh, endless, this ceaseless break of homage and praise to God with these four beasts. He had these six wings and these eyes all over. It's amazing. And they rested not day and night, saying, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Can you imagine that level of holiness in your own life? Now, will we ever attain holiness like, like our Heavenly Father? Of course not. I, tell, I mean, we, when we're in heaven, we'll be like Him. But I'm saying here on earth, you will battle this uncleanness and this impurity your whole life. And as an as a earthly father, as an earthly father trying to imitate your heavenly father, be holy. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, be holy. 1 Peter 1, 16, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Are you holy like your heavenly father? Because we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be just as pure 
untainted. Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. Don't be like the world. Don't be conformed to the world. Right? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How many of us are just like the world? We're, we're, we're impure. We're in the world, and we start to act like the world acts. And God says, that's not how you should be. Be holy. Be separate. Be clean. Be, be pure. Be different. Undefiled. Now, there may be some people that say, well, my dad was a really good guy, and I never really saw him sin. But if he was human, he sinned, because all have sinned. We know that. We might have had some good dads, but we didn't have any perfect dads. But you know what we should strive for? We should strive for blamelessness, right? Holiness. Where we are above reproach. You know, interesting, I had, a, I had Samuel and some others, maybe, I don't know, six, seven, eight of us last night at the house. It gets pretty cramped in our little house, but it works. And, uh, and Dr. Rasmussen, the, the vice president of the Bible college, called me answered the phone. I put it on a speakerphone. I said, hey, Dr. R. He says, hey, Joe, how are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. We talked for a little bit. He said, how's church going? Good. How's Joe going? I said, Joe's doing good. He's going home. Don't know what his plan is. Blah, blah, blah. And uh, as we were talking, as we were talking, I, I, I thought to myself, um, I wonder if it's okay to have him on speakerphone, but it just is a passing thought. It's kind of one of those passing thoughts. Later on, uh, we hung up the phone, and, and Dana made a comment. And I said, you know what? I didn't, I, I, I didn't question his testimony. And I told Dana, I said, you couldn't corner that guy into talking bad about somebody. You couldn't trip him up by accident. I said, he's beyond reproach. He is beyond reproach. He's above reproach. I, I'm not worried about him saying something he shouldn't say. Is, wouldn't that be great to, to have that testimony before your children? Where, where, your ki- where you're just never worried that your kids would, would hear you say something or see you looking at something or, 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 or know that you've said something. I mean, just, just to have a, a pure testimony, holiness. Be ye holy as I am holy. I think we often forget this when we talk about imitating likenesses of God. The best way to have this amazing testimony before your children as, as fathers is to live a holy life. You have so much peace when you're living a holy life. You're not worried somebody's looking over your shoulder or somebody's listening in on your phone call. You just are at peace. You have a good testimony. Holiness is a wonderful attribute that we can Try to imitate. Be ye followers of God as dear children. Imitate God's holiness. Thirdly, how about grace? Grace is amazing. This is, this is, this is profound. Now, the, the counterpart to grace is mercy. That's the counterpart. Therefore, God displays mercy to those he, he shows his grace. So that's the counterpart. But grace is a, is a big word. It's a hard concept. Dwight Pentecost Uh, He says this, that we might define grace as the intrinsic quality of God's being or essence, watch this, by which he is spontaneously favorable, or spontaneously, he spontaneously shows favor. It's amazing. Are you gracious toward others? Do you have the same grace that God had towards you? Do you have the same grace towards your kids as God had towards his? He's the God of all grace. John 1.17 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad we have the embodiment of, of, uh, of grace? We have Jesus Christ to show us how it is we ought to be gracious to others. And let me, let me, uh, let me try to challenge you men. Be gracious to your children. Be gracious to your children. If you've lived very long and if you've had your kids very long, uh, you probably can at least remember one time or two times or uh, a hundred times where you weren't as gracious as what you could have been. 
where you didn't show the love of God and it didn't come across in graciousness to your children? How many fathers have had that problem in their life before? Where they, maybe they just weren't as gracious to their children. Is there anybody maybe where they weren't as gracious to their children? Okay, I think everybody has. Max, you're a pretty good guy, but you're nodding your head. You know it. John, yeah, you got two little kids over there. I know it. I know this. Grace, 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 abundance of grace. It's not easy, is it? It's not easy when, you're, when, you're, when your kids are, are jumping up and down and they're, they're, they're kind of crazy or they're just talking so much and, and, and you just can't, you just are trying to focus and, and, and sometimes you, you're not patient with them. So you're not gracious to them. And you're not kind to them. Be gracious to your children just as Christ is gracious to with us. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful that God is gracious with us? I mean, yeah, let's just the most powerful being in the universe. You know, we think of like President Trump right now as being powerful, right? I mean, all he would have to do is get on his little phone and just say, take out Saudi Arabia. <laughs> he could say that to any, take out this you know, North Korea. I mean, God could just say, John, John Milo, gone. Joe Moore, gone. Bill Thomas, gone. Max Culberton, Joe Huss. I'm so thankful that God is gracious to us. That he shows long suffering toward us. Because you know what? I'm still a sinner and he still loves me. And nothing can separate me from that love. And he shows his grace toward us. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. Watch this. That ye through his poverty might be rich. God, who had everything, was reduced to nothing and gave you everything. Talk about the grace of God. This grace of God, Titus 2.11, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That's amazing grace. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to everyone, all men. You say, yeah, but what about, the, what about the wretched sinners? What about the Brooks Martins of the world? And, and what, about, what about the Samuels of the world? And, and the Molers of the world? And the, and the Collisons of the world? What about, what about the real bad people? What about the really bad people? Is, is there grace for them as well? What about it when your children are really, really, really bad? Is there grace for them? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, that's when God's grace is displayed the best. Romans 5.20 says, but where sin abounded, grace did that much more abound. With the really, 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 really bad ones, that's where God's grace is really shown, isn't it? If you want to be an imitator of God, if you want to be like your Savior, if you want to to know him, friends, know his grace. We can love, and we we can be holy, and we can be gracious, and we're called to be like our Heavenly Father. And to be imitators, to be imitators of God. As dear children. Sometimes I've said this before in church. I've said often, I've said it oftentimes, I do not want my kids to grow up to be like me. I have my own problems, right? I don't want my kids to grow up to be like me. I want my kids to grow up to be like God. You know, it's, it's funny, uh, from, from ever, ever since Ben was just knee high to a grasshopper, 
I guess that'd be pretty small. I don't know if he's ever been that big, but uh, knee high to a grasshopper. Ever since he's been just this little boy, uh, he's looked very, very much like me, and, uh, except I'm better looking. But he's looked very much like me. Actually, that means you're a good-looking kid. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So uh, anyway, he, uh, he's just been just this little, little guy, and he just had the same face and awesome build. He was always muscular. And, and, uh, and people are just, they look, they, look at, they look at the little guy, and they say, he's, he is just like you. He is just like you. And I thought, wow, you know what? He might look like me, but I hope he doesn't act like me. I hope he, I hope he doesn't act like me. I don't know. Do you ever think God's grace is so good that we can be like, that we can be like him? One day we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I mean, we are to be conformed to the image of his son. And God is working that in our life. I pray that my children turn out like God. Now, are they like God now? No. And I hope my grandchildren don't turn out like my sons. I hope my grandchildren turn out like their heavenly father. Well, we, we have such an amazing God with such amazing love who is absolutely holy, who is kind and patient and gentle. We might not have had that in our earthly father. We might have had a, a, a mean, un, impatient, uh, uh, you know, not gentle, not holy, not loving, uh, you know, earthly father. But can I tell you what? We can look to God and we can be thankful. And that's who we should be imitating. We should be imitating him. And even when we are at our worst, God is at his best. Grace is super abounding in those moments. We need to be a good earthly father. We need to be good Christians. Again, this isn't just for fathers. This is for the followers. This is for those people who are imitators. We all need to be imitators of Christ as dear children. Be imitators of God as dear children. Friends, before you leave this place, I just I think that everyone here has trusted Christ as their Savior. You you know what? Who was it this morning, Josh or Ben? They said to me, do you know Joe hasn't seen the wallet illustration? And I said, what? I thought I gave it a couple weeks ago. I'm going to give this illustration just for Joe, Okay. Can I use your wallet, Joe? No, actually, I know how much you get paid. There's nothing in there. <laughs> I want this hand right here to represent you and me, and I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says that God loves us but hates our sin. There's a lot of churches, a lot of people that say, well, if you just turn over a new leaf, uh, somehow God will, will love you more. But God loves his enemies. He loves his own, but he loves everyone. How can the greatest love ever shown in the world be improved upon just because you went to church? Or maybe just because you got water baptized. Or because you get, I threw 20 bucks in there, God loves me more. Oh, really? Throw 20 billion in there, God's not going to love you anymore. I might love you a little more. (laughs) But God will not. Because it's amazing love. Here we are with our sin. And the Bible says that this sin must be paid for. This sin right here brings separation. If you were to pay for this sin, you'll be separated from God forever because you're paying for your sin. The Bible says that the wages of this sin is death. Someone has to die. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross to pay for your sin. Because he loved you. Because of his amazing grace, he came to die on the cross to pay for our sin. And so you might ask, well, then how do you get to heaven? The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. 
It doesn't say, for by grace are you saved through water baptism, or for by grace are you saved through church membership. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for our sin. He was buried and he rose again the third day, proving that his payment was sufficient. It truly was finished, wasn't it? When he died on that cross, he paid for all of your sins, past, present, future. There's nothing you can do that will ever shake the grace of God. He loved us so much, he died for us. And friends, if you have that message and you share that with someone and they get saved, man, we'd love to know about it. Jesus died for us. That's an amazing heavenly father. And you know what's interesting? There's nothing you can do to ever lose it. You can't gain that love and gain that assurance by something you do, and you can't lose that love by something you don't do. You are secured, kept saved by the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. I'm so thankful for that. If you're here today and you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior, in the quietness of your own mind, if you say, the Lord, the best I know how I believe Jesus died for me. I believe he was buried and he rose again the third day. If it wasn't for the resurrection, we wouldn't have a Savior. The Lord may have died, but he didn't stay dead. He came back from the grave, proving he was indeed God. I'm thankful for that. We have the best heavenly father example. I mean, the best father, uh, father example is our heavenly father example. Yeah. It's amazing. Be followers of God as your children. 